Would you rather have Jesus? Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. Appreciated the message and song. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. What a week. You glad it's Sabbath? <laughs> wow. I heard one amen. For the rest of you, we'll pray. Be glad it's Sabbath? <laughs> amen. I want to welcome you to the first time in a year and what, three or four months that we have all been together in the sanctuary. We have a few downstairs and I want to welcome as well that are watching on the live stream and are protecting, needing to be a little bit more careful, but we're glad they're welcome joining with us today. And those of you on the live stream, welcome as well. God is good and it is a blessing to still be in a country where we can worship God with freedom, what do you say? There are countries right now, today, we've talked about this before, where you would not be able to worship like this. Not even in your house would you be able to worship. If you were caught with the Bible, you would be either beaten, stoned, or beheaded, depending on what part of the country you are in, or sent to a concentration camp if you're in other countries. I'm grateful to be in the United States. On this 4th of July weekend, we're going to take some time to, to meditate on the grazing of this country, how God has blessed in the rising, what has happened in its establishment, where we are headed as a country, and the ultimate freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. God is on the move. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And the events that are happening around us right now are some of the most important events that have happened in history. In church, we have the privilege of being a part of the final movement of ending this experiment with sin and going home to where there is no more pain or death. I want to go home. And I know you do too. Once we begin, would you bow your heads with me one more time as we ask God to guide us. Father in heaven, we bow before you as a family in this sanctuary, so thankful for what you have done, how you've raised this church up in this area and how every person that's in this room on the live stream and is downstairs, you have raised up to be a part of this church family. You are calling us as a people, to take an incredible message to the world. Right now, as we open your word, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and that you'll guide our minds, and that we might leave with a deeper appreciation and understanding of your love and grace. Hide me behind the cross. May Jesus alone be seen. In his name we pray. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The sermon title today is Freedom, period, Freedom, question mark, Freedom, all caps, exclamation point. Revelation chapter 12. In your mind's eye, I want you to travel back with me to Europe. It's the 15 and 1600s. The Reformation has been in full swing. Luther's nailed the 95 Theses on the castle church door. He, there has been an awakening across the general population that God has a message for His people. There has been a dividing that's also been taking place in Europe. There are some countries that are embracing the Reformation. There are other countries that are not embracing the Reformation. And some that are persecuting those who would stand faithful for believing and following God's Word. There's a story that happened in 1622. It's a distressing story. It happened to a group of people called the Waldensians. How many of you have heard of the Waldensians? Most of you have. For those of you who haven't, the Waldensians were uh, up in northern Italy in the Alps. They were Bible-believing Christians who were standing faithful for God's Word and had done it for thousands, hundreds of years, and over, I think, a thousand years. As they had stood faithful for God's Word, the uh, state church in that area began to persecute them relentlessly. 
And over hundreds of years, they had had to go higher and higher in the mountains to be more and more isolated. But they never forgot their mission, and that was to take the gospel to the what? The world. And the Waldensians would copy meticulously the Bible in the language of the people, which was illegal. They would copy passages of it by hand, and they would hide it in their clothing, and they would go around the Europe selling these Bible passages, no, giving these Bible passages to those who are interested. And God's word was being spread. But in 1622... The authorities decided it was time to remove the Waldensians. Are you there in Revelation chapter 12? I'll give you a few moments to finish turning there. We're going to pause our story and we're going to read the prophecy and then we're going to continue the story. Revelation chapter 12 is articulating the war between Christ and Satan. It starts off with a dragon who is wroth and um, and has been kicked out of heaven. He's making war with God's people. And as we come into chapter 13, the dragon, who's the dragon, by the way, church? Who's the only dragon? Satan. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the who, church? The woman. Who is the woman in Bible prophecy? I don't have time to study it with you. I heard some of you say it. It's the what? The church. The woman, uh, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for, read it with me, church, a time, times, and a half a times from the presence of the serpent. God's church had fled into the wilderness. The Waldensians, who were a part of that church, had gone higher and higher into the Alps. Isolated areas. I've been to the Alps. Beautiful area, by the way. Very isolated. Hard to get to. Even when we had modern technology and we're driving our car, there were times when we were afraid that our van might not make these very sharp turns on the road going up to where we were staying. Obviously, it made it because we're here today. A very isolated area. But notice what happens. They were protected for a period of time, but Satan is relentless in his persecution of God's people. You know this, but it's good to be reminded. Satan wants to destroy you and your family. Today and this next week and over this last week, and you probably face some of it, Satan has laid snares to destroy you and I. Not all at once, but little by little, he wants to pull us away from Christ. Verse 15, the serpent, Satan, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. A flood is released by the dragon. I want to tell you what happened during this flood. It's incredible. 1622, this is one of many stories that we could go to in 1622. 1655, I'm sorry. 1622 is coming later in my sermon. 1655. The Waldensians housed the soldiers that were coming unbeknownst to them to massacre them. For four days, they entertained them, they fed them, they housed them. And then on that fateful day in April, they awoke at 4 a.m. and the soldiers slaughtered most of the Waldensians. So horrendous was what took place, and so cruel was what took place, that the Protestant countries responded in force against France and the other countries that had been a part of trying to massacre these Waldensians. John Milton, the famous poet, wrote the following in, as he reflected in horror on what had taken place on that fateful morning during the massacre. He said, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughter is saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worship stocks and stones, forget not in thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks, their moans, the veils redoubled to the hills and to the heavens, their martyred blood and ashes sow, o'er the Italian fields where still doth sway 
the triple tyrant, that from these may grow a hundredfold who have learnt the way early may fly the Babylonian woe. It shook the Protestant world. England called for a day, several days of fasting and prayer. And the foe had to pull back. But God is never surprised by the things that happen in the affairs of man. And God had been preparing for the last several hundred years a country that would stand as a place of freedom in a world of persecution. Read the next verse with me, Revelation chapter 12, verse 16. What does verse 16 say? I want you to read it aloud with me. It'll be up on the screen in a moment. Read this together, all together. But the earth, what? Helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. What was happening around the year 1655? In fact, 35 years earlier, something momentous happened. Who can tell me? The pilgrims landed where? Here in Plymouth in the United States. Well, Satan was massing his forces to destroy God's people, God was raising up, church don't miss this, God was raising up a place of protection, an isolated place where his people and his truth could prosper. Someone should say amen. I don't care what you've gone through. I know there is someone here today who has had a terribly rough week or you've been in hand-to-hand combat, but I want you to see how this applies not just then but to you today. Whatever you've gone through, God will raise up a standard against Satan in your life. He is not surprised by the challenges you face. God was not taken surprised by the horrible massacre that happened or by the many that lost their lives. God was preparing a country and at the right time he raised this country, the United States of America, to be a place of freedom and a place of hope for his people who had been persecuted throughout this world. Praise God for his protection of his people. The earth opened and swallowed the water. 1620, the pilgrims landed. You know the story. We've been taught it for many years. Rhode Island was another place that was established. And slowly here in the United States, the ideas, it didn't start off with complete religious freedom. Pilgrims' Progress Fathers didn't understand fully religious freedom. But over the next several hundred years, religious freedom began to take root here. And by... July 4, 17 what? 76. A declaration of independence that included, enshrined within its declaration, the freedom to worship God as the conscience deems best was established, and this country, the United States of America, rose onto the world's sphere as a place, an experiment where people could worship and follow God as their conscience dictated. In church, we have the privilege of living in this country raised up by God. You know, there's a fascinating... Um, fascinating... Uh, quote I came across some years ago, and I have not, it was written by a gentleman in the 1800s. He was trying to describe the picture of God establishing this country, and it's so good, if you all don't mind, I'm going to read it for you here. Is that okay? He's trying to picture God's processing of the horrors in Europe and the need for America. It is not given to our poor human intellect to climb the skies, to pierce the counsels of the Almighty One, but methinks I stand among the awful clouds which veil the brightness of Jehovah's throne. Methinks I see the recording angel, pale as an angel is pale, weeping as an angel can weep, come trembling up to that throne and speak his dread message. Father, the old world is baptized in blood. Father, it's drenched with the blood of millions, butchered in wars and persecutions and slow and grinding oppression. 
Father, look with one glance of thine eternal eye. Look over Europe, Asia, Africa, and behold, evermore that terrible sight, man trodden down beneath the oppressor's feet, nations lost in blood, murder and superstition walking hand in hand over the graves of their victims and not a single voice to whisper, hope to man. He stands there, the angel, his hands trembling with the black record of human guilt. But hark, the voice of Jehovah speaks. Out from his awful cloud, let there be light again. Let there be a new world. Tell my people, the poor trodden down millions, to go out from the old world. Tell them to go out from the wrong, the oppression, blood. Tell them to go out from this old world to build my altar in the new. And at the command of God, a new country was raised up. God established this country. This country is not perfect by many, many means. There have been many awful stains on the establishing of this country. The horrors of slavery is one massive, blot is too weak of a word to use, one horrible part of the history of this country, for which we will suffer, I think, and still are, the consequences of that great evil. But this country was still a place where religious freedom was allowed and is allowed to prosper. Praise God for what he's done. Now go with me to Revelation 13. That was freedom, period. Now we go to freedom, question mark. We are living right now in the transition period of this country. From a nation that has been a place and a bastion, the world over recognizes a place of freedom. Thankfully, this country still is a place of freedom. Are you with me? But those freedoms are starting to be eroded over time. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. I don't have time to go into a long study on this, but it is very clear in a study that I would be happy to do, or one of us in the eldership or another church member may be able to do if you have questions on this, to study through who the beast is. But verse 11, let me just hit on a couple of key points. Are you there in Revelation 13, 11? Notice what it says. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the, what's the word there, earth, church? It's the earth. The United, uh, hmm. let me just quickly cover this. In Bible prophecy, there are two symbols for populated, or for areas where people live. There is water and there is earth. Water, according to the Bible, symbolizes what, Church? People's nations, language, tongues. If you have water, you have a highly populated area. If you have a place where there isn't water or earth, what would you have then? No water means that it must be a very unpopulated area. So this beast is coming up not where there's lots of population, but where there's not very much population. Now follow through with me. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. This Right here, like Revelation chapter 12, where it talked about the establishment of a place of safety for God's people, which is the United States. Revelation chapter 13 brings that same principle out, but it says that this country that's being established, a beast equals a country in Bible prophecy, this country that's being established, the United States, which came up in an area where there wasn't a great population, there was a mostly uh, an area where there weren't very many people living. There were people here, but not lots of people. That it would start off like a lamb, but it, then it would speak like who? A dragon. What's pictured here in this verse is a transition of this country that starts off as a place of religious freedom and a place where God's truth is able to be enshrined and to grow with the freedom of people to choose and worship as they see fit to a place that begins to speak like Satan. And Satan is not one who lets you do whatever you want. Satan's rule is force. And what I think we're going to start seeing is the loss, according to prophecy, what the Bible says is that we're going to start seeing in our country a move from a place where freedom is enshrined. This is freedom question mark. To where freedoms are beginning to be eroded until finally that great gift to worship God as your conscience dictates, is removed. 
You can read the rest of the passage there in Revelation chapter 13, 11 through 18, where it describes all that takes place. But I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about how some of those freedoms are even now being eroded. Religious liberty is slowly being taken away. There was a court case that happened this last week um, that the Supreme Court, I should say, refused to take that is continuing upon, along that line of religious freedom being eroded. It was for a baker who had refused, because of religious convictions, to make a cake for a certain couple that were doing something that she believed in her conscience she couldn't support by using her art. And the Supreme Court said, we're not going to take this case. We're going to leave you being under the previous enforcement, which was that she had to pay a massive fine and lost her freedom. In other areas, freedoms are being eroded. There is a law in the House that has been sitting there for several years. The reason it won't go any farther is the Senate currently isn't able to pass it that would prevent me from being able to speak publicly against certain lifestyle choices without facing fines or imprisonment. Thank God that law hasn't passed, but the fact that it's sitting in one of the two houses is concerning. Are you with me, church? And it's not just liberty that's being threatened. Sin is being celebrated. I was greatly disturbed as I looked up the statistics this morning for abortions in the United States and also around the world. And church, we should be very clear, abortion is wrong. We can love those who have gone through that. And if you are someone who has done that in the past, thank God Jesus is there graciously to forgive. What do you say, church? And we should not be judgmental in causing someone to feel like they are being cut down or maligned, but we should also be clear that abortion is wrong. Are you with me? Life starts when God begins the magic of creation. I was distressed to see today, as of this morning, 62,939,763 children have been aborted in the U.S. alone. In the world, that number is 1.62 billion. Jesus has got to come. This morning at the breakfast table, we were talking about in heaven someday. And Ellen White in vision was seeing heaven. And she saw an innumerable company of little ones with a border of red around their garment. And I wonder if many of these aborted babies God is graciously going to bring into heaven. It makes sense to me, doesn't it? God will do what he sees as best. But as we see these freedoms beginning to be eroded, there is a point that comes out crystal to me. Some people rest in security because their country gives them freedom. But church, our freedom doesn't come from the country we live in. Others get all worked up because they think that the freedoms are being lost. Church, our freedom doesn't come from our country. I'm a proud American citizen. But our freedom comes from Jesus Christ. That's the freedom we live in. And that freedom can never be taken away. Go with me now to the scripture reading we had. John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. I love this promise. Are you there? John 8, 34. Hear some pages turning. Love to hear them turning. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Verse 35. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Now, everyone read with me aloud from the screen, verse 36. Notice what it says. Reading together. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Here's the promise. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world around us. 
We don't have to get all worked up or afraid or concerned or thinking that our, our freedoms are being encroached on or how could this happen? No, church. We are free because Jesus has said you shall be what? Free indeed. Now, let's be clear. This freedom isn't to go and do whatever you want. It's the freedom to obey Jesus. You realize all through the dark ages, no matter how much persecution was happening, every person who was martyred for Jesus Christ was still free in Jesus. Now someone might say, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense at all. How could they be free in Jesus? Because their thoughts were always free to worship God. And Satan tried to come in. He tried through the rack, through the tortures, through whatever he could to make them think they didn't have a choice. But church, Jesus says when we're free in him, we are free in Jesus Christ. Go with me to Daniel chapter 3 very quickly as we close. You know this story. We're just going to hit the highlight. Daniel chapter 3. Three Hebrews are dragged, are standing in the plain of Dura. A massive metal gold image is there before him. Beside it are these huge ovens belching out fire, heat, and smoke. The command goes out from Nebuchadnezzar that when you hear the sound of the music, fall down and worship. If you don't, you're going to be put into the fire. And to human eyes, it looks like the freedom has been removed by the government. By Nebuchadnezzar the king. The church, we don't get our freedom from a human. We get it from who? And these three Hebrews understood that it doesn't matter what's happening in the situation around. They are free in who? And so they say to the king, look, we, well, they don't say anything initially. Initially, they just don't bow down. A messenger presses through the crowd, comes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, Nebuchadnezzar, the three Hebrews aren't bowing down. Nebuchadnezzar says, well, bring them here before me. He wants to give them another chance. He likes these men. He says, look, you're not an exception. You've got to bow down. And I want you to notice what these Hebrews say in response. Verse 16, notice what they say. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the what, church? And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Now I can hear Nebuchadnezzar in his mind going, whoa, 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 I wasn't asking you. I was telling you you're going to bow down. You ever heard someone say that? Maybe a boss, possibly a parent. And when a parent says it, they, you know, you just listen, but... My point is this, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't asking, he was saying, I'm telling you to do it. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. When it comes to the area of conscience, we're always free in Jesus. And we choose to follow him. And whatever you choose to do after that, that is your prerogative. And whatever God chooses to do, either to save us, either to deliver us by keeping us alive, or to deliver us by letting us die, did you notice that? Either way is a deliverance. We're going to follow the God of heaven. And God heard what they had done. And I can see Jesus going, okay, let's make sure he really, really gets that fire hot because I'm about to show the world what I do for my people. And I can see them throwing the fire in. And, and maybe I heard one evangelist, he said, I, maybe, maybe God told the, uh, said, make sure he throws in a couple extra firebrands. We really want this hot. Because I want to show my strength for my people. They depended on me and I'm going to show myself for them. And then the three Hebrews are brought. I don't think they came quaking. I think they came smiling. Because they were trusting in Jesus. There may have been some fear in their heart, but they trusted in the Lord. The soldiers throw them in. The fire is so hot that the soldiers actually die from heat. And the Hebrews, as they land in the fire, are welcomed into what they thought would be their death by the king of the universe as he says, welcome, I'm going to protect you. God honored their faithfulness. He protected them in the fire and they came out with a testimony on their lips of the power of God. 
Yes, we might be losing our freedoms. Yes, there may be things going wrong. But we serve a God who will protect you. I said, Pastor, that's great. But what about me today? All of us have our fires. All of us have the things that feel like they are pressuring us to do what we should not do. And there may be someone here today that you are under pressure from someone in your life to do what you know is wrong. You might be a young person. You might be an adult. Never forget. Never forget. You always have the freedom to choose Jesus. And no matter what they may say to you, you serve God. Now those words terrify an abuser or a manipulator. But live in the freedom of Jesus. That may mean you need to have a conversation with someone else in your life about how to deal with the situation you're in. Trust in the Lord. He'll carry you through. As we end, I want to touch on one other thing in the area of freedom, exclamation point. There's many who are afraid of where our country is headed. But I want to remind you that the God who took the Hebrews through the fire is the God who will carry us through whatever comes. We are here with one, with two purposes. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and learn to love him more. And secondly, to tell the world the message that he has given us. Next Sabbath at 9.30, there are 122 names that need to be given out who want to know how to live in the freedom that God has given us. Will you be here to tell them? Will you be here? Let's pray. Father in heaven, What a privilege to be in this country called the United States. A country that you have raised up. A country that has a lot of confusion right now. Father, I pray for some of us who may have thought that we were not really able to have the freedom to choose. Father, in a congregation this size and with an online watching of this size, I am sure there is someone that is listening to this who is in an abusive relationship and needs to stand up for, for right and to get help to get out. Father, I pray for that person right now that you will wrap your arms around them. Remind them of your love and of your power to set free. Father, I pray for that person that's here today who may be afraid of what's coming. Remind them that you who carry the three Hebrews through the fire will carry us through whatever may be. And finally, Father, I want to pray for the 122 people we want to pray that have asked for someone to come and tell them more. We pray that angels that excel in strength will be stationed around them. And Father, I ask that you will bring us out next Sabbath to be a part of taking the wonderful 
vital message that you have entrusted to us, to the community around us. Oh, we thank you. We praise you for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. you to stand as we sing our closing hymn and our song leaders are coming forward. Closing hymn is, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. marching on. Thank you that we can trust in you, that every need that we have, you supply. Oh, I pray that you'll bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here in this sanctuary. May you hold us in your hands, carry us forward in your strength, and may, Father, when we come back together here, we know that Jesus has blessed us this last week. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to thank each one of you for joining us today. We are going to be dismissing from the front to the back. And I'm also going to encourage us, there may be someone here today that wants to take some time to reflect on the message. Maybe you need to come up here and just spend some time in prayer. We've been doing this when we've been together for the last few weeks. So if you would like to just spend some time up here at the front in prayer or meditation, we're going to invite you to come up and do that as we dismiss. For the rest of us, I'm gonna, we're going to ask that we keep it quiet in the sanctuary for those who are up here. Can we do that, church? So, God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Let's keep quiet. And if you'd like to spend some time, you come on up here.